My name is Ted Sullivan. I'm a senior solutions architect for Lucidworks, so I'm kind of like uh, one, of the, one of the home team guys. And uh, somebody was joking at lunch that would I be giving a TED talk? No, that's a, that's a, patented, that's a patented acronym. I can't do that, so the TED police might be out there. Anyway, so uh, I've been working for Lucidworks for about two years as a senior consultant. Um, I, uh, it's Friday afternoon. I know everyone's getting, you know, kind of burned out. Uh, I myself have a plane to catch. So I've left as many business cards. I'll put the rest of my box out. So if I don't get a chance to talk to you after the talk, please grab a card, email me, you know, ask questions and so forth. I'm going to hope to get to questions. Uh, so, but I'll move forward with the talk and hopefully we'll get some questions during the talk. I'm notorious for, um, uh, not allowing much time for that. Uh, my background is as an academic uh, professor type that tends to lecture and go on off the mouth too much. You can tell that a little bit from the title because I say query introspection, which is kind of a PhD -E version of user intent. And uh, I've seen a lot of uh, stuff at the conference already about this very subject. And the, in fact, the talk that Trey Granger gave yesterday, if you didn't see it, uh, please check out the slide deck. It's an, it's an excellent talk. And there was another one from Dice uh, yesterday. I'm, I'm blocking on your name, sir. But every, a lot of people are starting to think about the question that I'm focusing on in my research area. You know, I have to do a day job where I, you know, tune solar and scale it and all that stuff. But in my free time, I try to figure out how to figure out what the user is asking for. And the way I used to phrase it is, what are they asking for, not what words do they use to describe it? Because traditionally, search engines will focus on just the tokens that you put in the query. And I see a lot of people are doing what I call query introspection, that is catching the query, looking at it, trying to figure out what it's about, and then maybe modifying the query to better the search results. So this is yet another example of that. Um, I'm using a knowledge graph, uh, much like uh, other people have used, but Oops, I'm going the wrong way. But this is a uh, little hint. The knowledge graph is actually the solar index. And this was an inspiration given to me by my colleague, Eric Hatcher. We were talking about knowledge graphs. And he said, well, the solar index is a knowledge graph. So if you think about it, when you have a lot of fielded data, like structured data, you have noun phrases, you have information in the index itself that tells you what the language of that search index is. And so if you have structured information, I'm going to show you how you can really, in a neat sort of way, pull it out at query time to do a better job of user introspect, query introspection, or what people are calling query intent or user intent. So that's the basic idea. And also, um, this is sort of a pet peeve slide, but a lot of People are now focusing more, and I think this is the right way to go. We already know we can scale, we can distribute, we're fault tolerant. Those are the engineering types of solutions. People are focusing more on the language part of the problem, uh, which is all about relevance, precision, and recall. But my question is, do we put the cart before the horse, meaning that we focus on relevance, right? We focus on getting the best thing. And there are quibbles about, well, precision is really getting the best thing on the first page. But to me, precision is about only returning correct things, not returning things that are not correct. And recall is returning everything that it should return. So precision and recall determine what matches and doesn't match. Relevance then computes the best matches from what is left. And that is, in fact, exactly how the Lucene engine works. It first does a matching on the query to find a set of candidate doc IDs. And then it sorts those based on a relevance formula. But the problem is, without focusing more on precision and recall first, we tend to get garbage in, garbage out. Uh, we tend to get a lot of noise hits that we then sweep down as, much, as best we can with our relevance to get them out of the first page. This works for the first page of results. But one of the things that the, the, the store of thumb that sticks out is when we use facets. Because the faceting engine has to see all of the doc IDs, all of the results that came back, and facet on those. And I, first, I kind of sort of rediscovered this when I was doing some pre-sale work for a client, and they were like a large retailer, like a Walmart type of thing, so they sold automotive parts all the way across the spectrum. And I searched for the phrase brake pads, and I got 
brake pads on the first page. Good, good relevance tuning, no problem. But if you look at the facets, there were stuff about baby accessories and furniture. So being curious, and don't say, well, why is that? You drill into the baby one, it turns out these are strollers that have the brakes on it. So you know the kid doesn't go down the hill while you're trying to buy something, right? So brakes was hitting on brake pads. The, the furniture thing was hitting on mattress pads. And this is a classic, classic example of a noise hit. Um, that improving precision starts with better phrase detection. Embarrassing noise hits like this are almost always due to phrase cross matches, meaning that you're matching on part of the phrase and you're getting you know, basically wrong hits because you do that. Now, synonyms can improve recall tremendously, but they need some help, especially when they're multi-term. This is an issue that many, uh, some of you may know that I've been working on to try to improve in solar. There's some known bugs in solar that make it difficult to use multi-term synonyms. And then we have the concept of stop words. Well, stop words are very important when you're trying to do term frequency inverse document frequency. You don't want them to, to per, you know, basically to wash out all the results. But stop words are still important within phrases. And this is an example of some uh, song titles. And you'll see that music is a sort of sub-theme in this talk. The Lady is a Tramp, you know, it's that great uh, a Rogers and Hart song that Frank Sinatra sang uh, in uh, My Pal Joey, I think, and versus The Lady and the Tramp, that Disney movie that, you know, when my kids were little, that's the only movie we got to see were Disney movies. So these only differ in the, there's noise words, lady and tramp are the only really key words in there. And that one, the famous Shakespeare soliloquy, is all noise words, right? So how do you deal with stuff like that? They, and noise words matter, as we'll see, in, in phrases. So, and a lot of people have been saying this, that this is not a, a new theme at this conference. It's kind of cool that I'm going sort of towards the end because I can you know, say that I'm not, every, a lot, everyone's starting to look at noun phrases. That is, how do you detect a noun, how do you know that brake pads is a thing and not just, it's not just composed of brakes and pads. Brake pads itself is a single thing. So a while back, um, I devised a technique, actually I stole it from a vendor engine, but I won't tell you who, uh, called autophrasing, where, which basically the idea of autophrasing, it recognizes when more than one word represents a single thing. And we'll see that language is tricky. Sometimes phrases mean one thing, but you can't treat them as an autophrase. I'll get to an example of that. So the autophrasing uh, token filter for the techies basically uses a knowledge base file called autophrases.txt, and when the query comes in, it actually texts the autophrases. Um, it also works at index time, so forth. It's a classic Lucene token filter. That, I will show you a demo of that and how powerful this can be in a minute. But query auto-filtering is actually what I'm going to talk about more in this talk. This is the uh, built-in knowledge base uh, idea. And it uses a, the phrases that are actually stored as metadata field values in your index. And there's a neat, nifty little software trick you can do using a thing called the Lucene field cache, which enables you to surface these and use that to then parse queries. Um, and I'm then gonna talk about what I call a novel approach to natural language processing, where we're actually mapping noun and, and verb phrases. This is a new addition to the code that uh, has only happened within the last month or so. I'm very excited about. Where we can start to actually do quasi-NLP, or what I call NLP light, without having to use PO, the traditional methods, not to say that those are not important, but they still are. Every tool has its use and every tool has its position and place to use it. And I'm gonna to get to at the end, uh, basically a musical analogy where I can actually answer that question, who's in the who? So I think that, that was when I had that, yeah, it actually works, this is cool. <laughs> so this is a demo that I've actually shown before and some of you may have seen it. Uh, the, class, the JIRA ticket that talked about the multi-term synonym problem in solar used these uh, the New York and city as an analogy. And on the left, you have all the autophrases for both the state of New York, which was where I was born, and the city of New York. I uh, grew up on Long Island. So of course, this example sort of resonated with me 
uh, we New Yorkers tend to be fairly, uh, you know, fairly chauvinistic, I guess. Uh, so those are the autophrases for both the city and the state. And on the right, I'm showing you the synonyms doc text, which uses a couple of tricks that some of you may not be aware of. So on the top one, you see New York, and you notice the underscores there. That's something put in the, by the autophraser to make sure that these things are tokenized as a single token rather than separate words. And there's another talk by, the, by Dice that are actually doing the same type of thing. So it's, what you want to do is you want to make New York a thing, but keep the character length the same so you can highlight and all these kinds of things. So this is a one-way synonym expansion, meaning that New York, and this is a query time one-way synonym expansion, I should say, New York extends to all of the possible variations of New York State and New York City because New York can apply to both. So it's sort of like a hierarchical thing. And then these next two are bidirectional synonyms, which uh, say that New York State is the same as Empire State, is the same as NY State, is the state of State of New York. And of, there's one of these stop words that actually means something in a phrase. And New York City, Big Apple, New York, New York, NY, NYC, City of New York, stuff like that. So when you add this token, tokenizer in and do the work, and now I'm comparing uh, in the dark blue the classic request handler, as we say in Solar, select handler with the auto phrase handler. And these are some sample phrases uh, that were indexed and searched. So you see that uh, when I search for New York, all of these uh, things are about either New York or New York City, so correct recall means that it should return all of them, right? Because New York is ambiguous. And the autophrase parser does, but the out-of-the-box thing only returns the one that has the phrase New York in it. So it misses NYC, it misses Big Apple, even though you can do synonym expansion, but it doesn't really work too well. Same thing with NYC. The uh, select handler does a, does a poor job of both precision. Um, it's returning things that it shouldn't, um, the, the one on the bottom, and recall. It's not returning all the things that it should. And New York State, again, same problem. The select handler fails in both precision and recall. So this is a very simple example of how getting the phrases right and mapping them correctly to tokens in solar, uh, you can vastly improve both precision and reef call. Now this is a toy example, but I know that there's a lot of usage of the autophrasing parser out there, and I'm very gratified to see that. There's also some improvements that have been made in the original code that we hope to uh, add to the JIRA ticket. So expect a new and improved uh, autophrasing parser on GitHub and JIRA soon. So now I want to switch over to the query auto filtering, which I want to focus on. Um, and this, as I said earlier, doesn't need an autophrases.txt because it takes that information from the index itself. And it uses a Lucene uh, object structure called the field cache. The field cache essentially has what they're now calling an uninverting index, meaning a forward index. It's a, actually a double negative there. And what that means is in an inverted index, you map from a, a token to all the documents that have that token. Um, in a forward index, you map from a, fi a, to a field to all the values that occur in that field. There's also another concept in solar called doc values, very similar. So what the auto filter does is it reads the Lucene field cache and then flips that again and creates a map of all the values back to the field that they came from, or fields, plural. And that will give you uh, string fields in solar uh, will be exact match. So if you want to handle things, natural language things like synonyms, stemming, meaning getting the root form, we add that up front to the query auto filter so that it can also handle synonyms. And we then use this map to discover the noun phrases in a query, and then we can map those immediately to either a filter query, meaning something that just filters on the, these values and returns exactly what has those values, or uh, a boost query, as I'll talk about. So if we really not want to be too aggressive, we can just boost the things that have values in those fields. And it uses a very simple uh, algorithm, which is longest contiguous phrase wins. And then we can, as I said, I already covered this, we can build a uh, filter or boost query. 
And you, you may have heard me uh, busting uh, Haussmann's chops last night. This is the Jira ticket I was talking about. It was published in, uh, uh, at the end of May this year. It had one comment so far, as I looked at it last night, a plus one from a fellow named Bill Bell. If you're out there, Bill, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope to get some more interest in this JIRA ticket so we can you know, get it committed, hopefully, and you guys can use it without having to patch your solar. That would be cool. So this is the basic behavior that the Query Auto Filter provides, and this is stuff comes from, from some blog posts that I've written on this subject. So I have a query red socks, um, and I have all this data in uh, the index. The Auto Filter recognizes that red is a value in the color field, that socks is a product type, and it can create a FQ, if, if you guys are technical enough to know that, or basically that does that intersection. In other words, semantically, or linguistically, there's an implicit and between red and socks. And this was actually something that I discovered in a client interview. The, the, the term then was red sofa. And they said, we're having problems with red sofa. And I said, let me guess, you're getting responses back of red things that aren't sofas as well as sofas that aren't red. And they said, yes, how did you know? But that's because it's basically a bag of words. And this solves that problem. Now, you notice that red socks or red sofa can't be treated as an auto filter, I'm sorry, as a uh, auto phrase, because there are just too many permutations. Of, you'd have to have an auto phrase for every possible color, every possible product. So this isn't, it's, it is an auto phrase in the sense that red socks represents one concept, but you really couldn't use it in the same way. Uh, it gets more interesting when you start doing the fact that red is a color, but it's also used a lot in marketing and product names. There, you know, Johnny Walker, red label. There's all kinds of black swan this, white linen that. There are all kinds of product names, and, and this is actually a fairly common problem in e-commerce, that have a product name, a brand like Red Lion, which is actually a manufacturer of uh, football, as you would say in the rest of the world, in soccer apparel, as we would say here in the US. Uh, so red lion socks, uh, the auto filter will say, okay, red is a color. Oh, red lion is a brand, so I'm not gonna use the color because that's a better match, it's a longer match. Socks is a product type, so it actually goes brand red lion product type socks. You notice it's capitalized everything because string fields are exact match. So that's the actual value that's in the index and it has to translate to that. It allows lower casing and all that stuff input, but output is that. that's more, the next one is about synonyms. If I have lounge chair as a synonym for scarlet, chaise lounge, or, and scarlet is a synonym for red, those sorts of things. The next one is interesting. Uh, I'm gonna focus on this one here, the white linen shirts. Here's a case where I talked earlier, white linen, as the, the women in the audience will know, uh, I don't know if they still are out there, but they were a brand of cosmetics. And so white linen makes perfume, I remember those commercials. But white is a color, linen is a material type, and it'll help a dress shirt. So if you have white linen shirts, the auto filter says, oh, okay, white linen is a brand, but I'm not gonna get too aggressive. It could also mean white and material linen and product category shirts. So what it's doing is automatically building all the possibilities. Now, it, it probably could get smarter and, and the, the, the reason that it actually works in reality is because white linen, the brand, doesn't make shirts. So you actually have two layers of filtering going on in which the auto filter kind of guesses, but it, over, it, it basically gets conservative because it has to cover, has to make sure that it's getting the recall, but because there's no such thing as white linen, uh, sorry, uh, white linen shirts as a brand, the second one hits, right? It would do the same thing for white linen perfume, but since there's no, there's, perfume isn't the color white, right? And it's not made of linen. There are no actual instances of that. So in the end, it gets the right answer. Here's another one, or red and gray dress shirts. This actually goes into another interesting thing that I discovered. I'll just cover the next slide so I can get through uh, without hitting my time limit. So I actually discovered in the process of this that when people put Boolean, uh, Boolean logic into their queries, so I want to see this and this or this or this, we know as computer scientists uh, that Boolean operators have a very precise meaning and they're very important in both what we do, search, 
which is uh, derived from set theory. As I said, search is just about returning a set of one thing given a set of other things, query tokens, right? So we know what they mean in computer science, and they're, they're always mean the same thing. So and always means intersection or union, not exclusion. And for those non-programmers, those little symbols are what we Java coders will recognize immediately as and or not, right? But in language, it turns out that and and or are contextual, and they depend on the, sometimes they're synonyms, and sometimes they're the opposite. And it actually depends on whether the field we're talking about is single value or multi-value. I'll give you an example. So if, assuming for an instant that this is not really correct, but that color is either single value or multi-value. And if that's the way it's defined in your solar index, then it is that, right? So if I say, show me blue or red shirt, what I mean is I want to see both blue and red. If I say, show me blue and red shirts, I mean the same thing. So if it's a single value field, it turns out that and and or are actually synonyms. However, if it's a multi-value field, I'll give you an example, supposing uh, I'm, I'm buying a car and I want cars that are fuel efficient and uh, inexpensive. There I really do mean and. I don't mean I want to see fuel efficient cars that are really expensive or, so and when it's multi-valued actually means and, and or actually means or. And the cool thing about the query auto filter is since it knows what field it came from and it can talk to the schema, it can know the cardinality of the field. So it can actually do a better job of dealing with and and or within a natural language query. Without that, we just throw them out. They're stop words. They're, we don't want, unless the user actually types in capital O-R, and there was an example from yesterday where the noun phrase was Portland, comma, O-R, and then some other stuff. And it didn't mean Portland or the other stuff. It meant Portland, Oregon. Right? So in that case, capital O, capital R was, would be ambiguous. The search engine would totally screw it up without any help. The, net, the auto filter, the, the phrase matching, would say Portland OR. I know what that is. That, and then take it out of the set of tokens that it had to then consider for Boolean matching. So pretty cool, right? All right, so let me uh, move forward here and uh, give you basically the background for the rest of the talk. So I was trying to figure out um, a venue or sort of a, a domain that I could use to explain some of these data science concepts. And since I figured everybody loves music, as I do, uh, that we could do this. So I've created an ontology, and I just saw a very, very cool talk at, by the folks at, B at, B at B of A, Bank of America, uh, about using ontologies. And ontologies have been around for a long time, but they differ from taxonomy because they can have hierarchy, but they can also have relationships. So here's a rough model of a music anthology. You have a song, which is a comp type of composition. The song has a songwriter or songwriters. It has a genre, right? Uh, a recording of the song is an actual performance of that composition. Uh, in you know, modern day, a recording can be a part of an album. The recording has a performer, has a record label, has a producer. Then there are, inst the, there are musicians or groups of musicians band, pianist, guitarist, vocalist, et cetera. So um, I crafted a manual, uh, manually crafted a very small music ontology, still pretty big, but uh, using uh, Protege, uh, the open source product from Stanford. And then I pieced together, uh, wanted to put it into a collection. So what I end up with and wanted to show you is what I'm calling uh, front-end NLP, Precise free text searching of structured metadata, and the structured metadata came from this ontology. And there's also a lot of stuff that I had to do to process it. I'll talk a little bit about it as we go, but I don't really have time to go into all those details. If you're interested, you can email me. So the query out filter can take natural language queries and turn them into structure. But we've already seen part of that, right, with the with the, just the noun phrase mapping to fields. But I've added uh, the, the ability to process both noun and verb adjective phrases. And I'll show you how that's really cool. So, for example, take the example of Beatles songs. Um, Beatles songs is an interesting uh, noun phrase because it's actually one subject or object, not two. Because Beatles precede songs, so these are the songs that the Beatles either performed or sang. 
If you say songs Beatles sang, then that's not the same thing. Songs and Beatles are now subject and object nouns, whereas Beatles songs is itself a subject or object noun, the phrase. So that's an interesting thing. So now I can actually say things like Beatles songs written by George Harrison. I'll show you a demo of this later. Willie Dixon's songs covered by Led Zeppelin. And with a little extra help beyond the basic noun phrase parsing, I've got basically a structured query out of an unstructured query without using any programming. And that's my tagline, look mom, no sequel. There's a space there, if you didn't get that joke. So, uh, and here's basically some of the secret sauce. So noun phrases are mapped to field name, field value pairs as we've seen before. So, but there's ambiguity. Um, so if I say Bob Dylan songs, who I, you've ever seen that Watson commercial lately? So Watson has read all of Bob Dylan's lyrics, um, which is probably pretty impressive. If he can tell us what they all mean, though, that would be more professor. <laughs> I think he was just uh, basically a lot of his songs. I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, but I think a lot of his songs were actually just, you know, rhyming stuff. But there is actually a professor at Boston University where my son went, whose basically research problem is understanding Bob Le Bob Dylan, you know, at a deeper level. <laughs> so I was like, oh wow, that that's got to be fun to do. Anyway, so. Uh, for Bob Dylan songs, we know Bob Dylan wrote many, many songs, and he also performed many, many songs. Um, so it would, the autophrase would automatically detect, a query auto filter would detect that Bob Dylan was both a composer and a performer. So it would put an or in there just to make sure it got everything. Um, but if I then want to map verb phrases, if I say songs written by Bob Dylan, then I want to drop the performer part. If I say, uh, with songs performed by Bob Dylan, then I would want to drop the uh, composer part. And there's an also another twist on this, which I did on the ontology, which is interesting. Um, so we all know what a, uh, sort of what a cover is, and the definition of a cover is somebody that records or performs a song that they didn't write. So Bob Dylan performed a lot of songs by other artists. Those are what I would call Bob Dylan covers. And what's interesting about the ontology is you can actually discover when a performance of a song is a cover versus an original by just tracking it back to the, the composers and the groups. For example, Beatles song would be any song written by John Lennon, Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, or George Harrison. So if there's another song that, say, Smokey Robinson, you, you, you know, you've, got, you've got me, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blocking on the song, or Chuck Berry, Roll Over Beethoven, those are covers because Chuck Berry wrote the song, but the Beatles performed it. And of course, there are many more, in some popular songs, there are many more covers than there are originals, right? So it'd be interesting to see that. I'll show, actually show you a demo of that. But on the left, you really can't, on the right, sorry, you really can't see this, but this is some of the additional uh, verbiage that I put in to the auto filter called verb modifiers that map different verb phrases to the field at which it should collapse to. And then the one on the bottom is a little more interesting because it's basically taking a pattern, and this would do the Beatles songs, and saying if you see uh, a, a entity that is an original performer followed by a composition, then, and also the covers occurs, then I want you to do the sort of manipulation of the query so that we can then make songs Bob Dylan covered versus covers of Bob Dylan songs work correctly. Okay, so with that, uh, I will put myself into harm's way. Um, the first thing I have to check is make sure that we're up here um, and run a demo of some of these. Oh, I need to, sorry. This is Fusion, but it's really just using the UI. So let's make sure we still have a live system. Okay, so here we go. So let's just try um, Beatles songs. Now we have uh, Beatles songs, but you notice that there are also other composers besides the, the four guys. So I, if I want to say, I want to just find out the Beatles songs that they covered, um, I would say songs Beatles covered. 
And now I'm just seeing stuff by Chuck, all the other guys. And you don't see Lennon, McCartney, Harrison in there, right? And I can then drill in with facets, of course, and still say, okay, Chuck Berry, rock and roll music, you know, you know that one, and roll over Beethoven from the early. And you notice a lot of these, if you had on albums, they're mostly the early albums. The later albums, they wrote everything themselves. Um, let's do the, the who's in is a verb that I mapped to member of or member of group. So let's just do the who's in the who. Oops, that was what I was afraid of. Okay. Demo gods are back at work. I think what happens is, and uh, I'm afraid this is my company's product, but it's an older version. I think what happens is, There you go. Okay. It, 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 was, it was getting confused as to what request uh, handler it was supposed to use. So now who's in the who brings us back uh, the four members of who. I can do stuff like uh, Willie Dixon, who's a blues artist. I, I'm showing my age here, I know. Uh -huh. Willie Dixon songs covered by Cream or Doors, oops, no, it's doing it again. Anyway, so, but you get the basic idea. Uh, and it, it's still working in solar. So there's some, this fusion is forgetting what the, it's supposed to use this auto filter request handler. Let me see if I can get it back up. Come on. No. It wasn't doing it that often earlier today. It's Murphy's Law, it just descends on you when you're trying to do a live demo. So I can go back out. Uh, back in, maybe try one more time. Because right, we're running, we're getting a little late, so I need to push on. So, sorry about that, but yeah, it does work. Um, you've seen a little bit, but there's something flaky going on in this UI. So, sorry about that. All right, so back to the talk. Um, so, that really uh, finishes up with uh, what I call the first part, and I'm going to try to get through, uh, let's see, I'm 30 minutes in, so I should really try to rush this. Uh, so we can get the questions. So the next thing I was interested in is you have these cool phrases that people can search on. It would be nice if you could suggest them, right? So that the user doesn't have to think them up and you can get precise. And suggesting, of course, is a really cool thing. So I came up with an idea, uh, a radical idea, basically to create what I call multi-field suggestions using solar pivot facets, which are normally used after the query. So I'm actually using faceting now, as you'll see in the next, to generate stuff. And I'll see, show you an example of uh, what people call predictive analytics doing the same technique. So this is a basic build graph. So I'm building a suggester collection at the bottom, which contains these multi-field phrases. Um, and I'm developing those from pivot facets. And if you don't know about pivot facets, uh, Haasman has published some really cool blogs. Uh, Trey Granger's group has done a lot of great work. But just to basically, uh, this is, the, I want to focus on the bottom part. Uh, this is stuff I should have talked about earlier, denormalizing the graph, building out the solar index from an ontology, which is cool stuff, but I don't have time to really go through it right now. But the pivot facets are pretty cool. So once I have all these fields, I can say, I want you to show me all of the examples of genre followed by musician type, and I'll put the S in to make it more palatable to, you, to English readers. So it comes up with things like rock drummers, heavy metal bands, uh, you know, progressive rock uh, guitarists, classical pianists, I had to throw in there five minutes, she says, and so forth. So I can then build out these patterns for a suggester that then the query auto filter will magically do the right thing. Cool, right? Um, and the other thing I did using uh, facets was basically I get the queries, I then run them back against the content collection, and I can then use facets at that point before I build a suggester collection to get context, right? I actually have a, a job where we have to uh, security trim the queries, so that was the technique that I came up with run the queries against the content, pull back the ACL facets, then when they do the query, you can see, well, you can't see that query because the only 
results that come back, you wouldn't be able to see. So it's a zero result query for you. But what I realized is you can actually use that for anything else, like context. And as I said, facets are traditionally used for visualization and navigation. We can repurpose this to make a smarter suggester, okay? So this is one thing you can do with it. And a lot of people have been talking predictive, um, predictive analytics. And when I was building this ontology, and I was Googling and Wikipediaing like crazy, right? So I'm on Google, and, I'm, and you know the type ahead stuff, so I'm, maybe I'm searching for Bob Dylan songs. After a while in that session, it gets really eerie because I'm typing in two letters, and it's suggesting an entire song title as if it already knows I'm searching for Bob Dylan songs. Well, well we, can, we can actually do this by pulling, when we get the suggestion, we can say, well, what are the, uh, what are the other attributes of that those values and build, bring back these facets, and then when we pass the, the suggestions back to the type ahead thing, we can tell it what, it what context that thing has. So if they click on a Bob Dylan song, after a while it's going to know, or Beatles song, after a while it's going to know they're searching for Beatles songs, and there are like plenty of, there's actually a joke YouTube thing about somebody singing all the songs that start with baby, but these are in the modern era, I didn't know most of the songs. But going back to the jazz age, there are plenty of songs that start with Baby. If the thing knows I'm searching for Beatles songs, all of a sudden, Baby's in Black and Baby, You're a Rich Man start to come to the top. So this is an actually added bonus of doing this faceting, which you can actually do what I call, call now on-the-fly predictive analytics, because usually predictive analytics requires that you wait to crunch all the data from previous sessions, and Google is not doing that. If I switch gears and start searching for something else, it won't get it right at first, but eventually it figures out what I'm doing, maybe not with this technique, but some kind of maybe pattern matching technique like you guys are doing, uh, you know, phrase matching technique. What have people searched for that also search for this types of recommendation technologies? But this, is, this blew my mind too, as well as you know, getting the who's and the who right. So I've run out of time, as I tend to do. Uh, I have a few minutes for questions, but as I said, uh, if you're interested in uh, c connecting with me later, uh, I've got cards up here. I'm happy to uh, entertain you know, email discussions and so forth. Thank you for your time. I appreciate your attention.